All right, good morning. Thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions about anything that's discussed in this webinar, you can always email Scott Ward, which is sward at esri.com. Today, um, presenting, we have myself, Ben Conklin. I'm the industry manager for the defense and intelligence industry in our marketing department. We're also joined by the always unflappable Eric Bader, the product manager on our runtime team, and Carrie Robinson, who is our product owner for our defense capabilities and our software development team. With that, let's go ahead and get started. So welcome, thank you for joining us today for our um, defense um, developer series. This is the first webinar in the series. So hopefully if you're joining me today, um, you're, you are a developer or you know a developer or maybe you play one on TV. But what we're gonna be talking about today is developing and building mission focused apps um, centered around location and GIS. So why are we talking about this today? So at the high level, we are finding that location mapping and GIS are becoming essential. The reason for that is really simple. People can read and understand maps. Maps provide us a fundamental language for understanding and managing our world. They provide us a context for everything that's happening around us, and they help us with content about what's going on. So to understand the context of our operations and to understand the impact our operations are having on the world around us, location mapping and GIS are essential to that. Next slide. And part of the reason for that is that GIS provides us a framework and a process for many different essential aspects of building and developing applications and integrating information. To begin with, GIS gives us a way to integrate data using time and space and to manage content and information to be able to have managed data available to every one of our users. The primary reason that most people want to bring data and information into a GIS is so they can use it for visualization and mapping. So they want to see their dots on a map. But that's just the beginning. GIS also allows us to do deep analysis and modeling. So we have analytic capabilities to, to go beyond the data, to understand the data, how it's related and how it's linked together. This supports many different workflows, like developing plans and designing for the future, supporting robust decision-making, so collaborating together to make decisions and to share information in a decision-making process, and to communicate those decisions so action can be taken and then, then coordinating those actions together by maintaining a shared situational awareness with everybody else involved in your operation, and then feeding that information back into your headquarters and continuing this cycle or this process. It's applying the science of geography along with the technology of GIS to help us have a smarter world, to help us think and act better and create a more sustainable and more secure future. Next slide. The main reason that people are using GIS, of course, is to integrate data. And the way that we integrate that data is by bringing this data together and representing it in an abstract way in what we call layers and maps. And these layers of information connect to data sets like imagery, tabular data, vector data, 3D data. But they can also connect to sensors, so IoT sensors in real time. They can connect to big data systems in the cloud. They can consume new kinds of information that, that's being made available, like LiDAR and other data sets. All that data gets represented in what we call layers and put together in maps. And those maps are made available through a variety of different applications. Next slide. And what we see in the transformation of GIS is that people, everybody in an organization wants access to maps and authoritative data. So people are expecting that they can pull out their phone or log on to their laptop or connect to their device and have access to the authoritative data at any time just like they would at home. They would use Google Maps to navigate from their house to the restaurant. But in the world that we operate in, thinking about the defense world and the public safety world, they don't wanna to navigate to McDonald's, right? They wanna to navigate to that distress call, or they wanna they want to share information about the enemy order of battle or observations they're seeing, or maybe the Blue Force tracks. That information is made available through applications, modern, lightweight, focused applications. And these applications bring this power of GIS to everybody. And these applications are focused in that they're easy to use, they're responsive, and they're easily accessible. And Esri provides a variety of these applications, but more importantly, we provide a toolkit, a software development kit for all of you out there to build these focused apps to actually bring the power of GIS into the hands of your actual users to have those mission-focused applications. Next slide. And so what do we mean when we talk about mission-focused apps? 
what we mean is this kind of new world. What I what I would say is the the old world of kind of defense and, and situational awareness apps was four years of developing software. A year, you know, for example, you start off with one year of gathering requirements and two years of developing software to the spec of those requirements, and then a year testing and fielding and deploying the application. That world is over. That's not the world that we're talking about anymore of these big, gigantic, monolithic apps that take hundreds of people to build. What we see is this new world, this world of these lightweight, focused applications. These applications are built in an agile manner, so quickly, rapidly developed, tested with real user input and feedback. These are high-performance apps with the data and information needed bundled into them, and they're simple and focused. And it's a world of a variety of apps. So as developers, you should be really excited about this. You have an opportunity to build applications that are specifically designed to support the operations of your users, which they can easily get up and running, and then you can constantly evolve and develop over time. We see this transformation happening in many different industries, and we see there being lots of chances for people to take and build these things. And so what we're doing is we're developing a toolkit to help you get up and running to build these agile, high performance, and simple applications. And these tools should be able to help you get jump started on building these apps where a map and inf geospatial information is an integral part of it. And then you can integrate it with other critical systems. So all the data and information that people need access to is there at their fingertips. Next slide. So at this, I'm going to turn it over to Eric, who's going to take you through what are these tools, what is the foundation of these tools that we're building for you to help you build these mission-focused apps. Great, Ben. Hey, thanks a lot for that great overview. So I'm going to take a few minutes here to just talk about the high-level um, story that Esri has for um, developers. So ArcGIS is a uh, great platform for developers. Um, it provides developer tools, as Ben was alluding to, for um, any application scenario, right? It's from building standalone web or native applications, extending existing apps using state-of-the-art and open developer platforms, to ArcGIS desktop and server extensibility, to all the way to automation of tasks and workflows that are uh, important for your organization. For developers and their users, ArcGIS has made uh, accessible and customizable for any connected or disconnected environment on almost any device at any time or any place. Our developer platform was strategically designed with three goals in mind. First, easy access for developers to get the tools, easy and intuitive developer experiences, and easy and smooth deployment experiences. These three are key to providing a great world-class SDK. So developers use ArcGIS APIs to build almost any kind of application that can be built, whether uh, these applications are large enterprise applications or apps uh, for the field or apps for the community at large. These APIs and SDKs are founded upon a common RESTful specification and they share a common object model for accessing the ArcGIS platform at every level. So ArcGIS APIs and SDKs give developers the ability to build open and interoperable solutions. This is extremely important in a, in a connected world, right? So ArcGIS supports many of the Open Geospatial Consortium or OGC standard data formats and services, as well as many different open databases and open platforms. This kind of interoperability is really empowering for system integrators who often bring mission critical disparate systems and user workflows together. So let's take a closer look at these APIs and SDKs for building applications. Developers can leverage modern developer platforms and programming paradigms through ArcGIS APIs and SDKs. This includes both modern web, cloud, and disconnected or embedded standalone platforms. The ArcGIS JavaScript API, for example, is one of the most powerful mapping and visualization web frameworks on the market today. On the other side of the slide, on the native side of the platform spectrum, the ArcGIS runtime SDKs give native client application developers the same rich ArcGIS functionality for building desktop and mobile solutions. Using these native APIs, ArcGIS workflows can be taken offline and into the field then synchronized back when connectivity is reestablished. 
This enables a seamless ArcGIS workflow experience for app users, which is critical. Uh, considering all sides of the programming spectrum, whether a developer's choice of platform is iOS, Android, JavaScript, Java, .NET, QML, or C++, whether the developer is advanced or if the developers are newbies, Esri's API strategy has been architected and exposed the same intuitive GIS object model and feature sets that are common for all. So looking a little more closely at the ArcGIS JavaScript API, just to give a very high level uh, approach to this very rich um, platform, uh, what are the benefits that developers experience with the ArcGIS API for JavaScript? Well, they get a modern industrial strength web API for mapping, visualization, and analysis and web building web applications and cloud applications. Uh, the API supports data-driven visualization. This is a very important part of the platform. Uh, what I mean by this is um, data is derived from values that formulate uh, the visualization and presentation of the data, which tells the story. Uh, the API supports world-class spatial analytics, from basic analytics to extremely advanced, leveraging both the client and the server for analytical geoprocessing and many different geometric operations uh, at any scale. Uh, the API provides a rich set of out-of-the-box widgets that are also customizable and a platform that allows you to build your own widgets, but they come from out-of-the-box uh, also for rapid application development of your web applications. The ArcGIS Runtime SDKs themselves now we'll take a look at. These are useful for developers who want to build and or integrate with natively running applications. These are applications that run outside of a browser and run within the hosting device's computing ecosystem. So it's part of the device. They actually run as services and part of the device themselves. These SDKs are all founded on the common core runtime library, which is compiled for many different platforms. The, the most common ones, Android, Mac OS, the iOS platform, various forms of Linux, UWP and Windows native operating systems. So the core library uh, is underlying of six individual public APIs that the developers program against. And these are Android, .NET, Objective-C and Swift for iOS development, Java, Cocoa for the Mac OS development, Qt C++, and Qt QML. So this strategy, it's useful for uh, selecting the development environment of choice as they each integrate with their specific industry standard tooling, IDEs, and build processes. So why, why does Esri have a native strategy? Um, you know, we're in a world of thin client and mobile first. Lots of apps run in browsers. But there are strong reasons for building apps that run outside of the browser and directly integrated with the operating system of the device itself. For one, applications and their workflows are free to transition seamlessly from connected to disconnected environments and back again, right? The apps have direct native access to sensors and services provided by the device, such as GPS, Bluetooth, and file storage. Apps can interact in the same ecosystem on that device as other native apps that run on that same device. So a key characteristic of native apps is the unparalleled performance gains. This is the, the one of the, the most uh, important reasons why people go to native is the performance. Apps, these apps run as close as you can get to the bare metal for rendering and um, smoothness, delightful, the smoothest delightful user experiences you can get. And of course, they're publishable to all the app stores and marketplaces. Great, so t we're gonna pass this over to Kerry, who's gonna take us into uh, an example of what was built with these uh, native SDKs, the dynamic si situational awareness um, appli uh, example application. So I'll hand it over to Kerry. Okay, thanks Eric and thanks Ben. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this dynamic situational awareness example app that we've built, or we call it DSA for short. Um, so DSA is a complete open source example application. 
This means that we've written some code to show best practices for developers who are writing solutions to meet the situational awareness needs in a disconnected intermittent and low bandwidth environment. So back to what Ben was talking about, we want to give you an example of how to build a lightweight mission focused app, but also bringing in the power of GIS for, uh, to help with your situational awareness needs. So there's several key characteristics that we, uh, what we're, we want to show as part of this app. Um, because these are typically in disconnected environment, it's key to be able to work with local data or offline data with no reliance on a GIS server to be providing um, those services. So you need to be able to disconnect from that environment and, and still function. Um, it's also critical that you can share your location with your teammates in the field and that you can always see their last known position. So this information is typically shared over a peer-to-peer -peer or ad hoc network using devices such as tactical or mesh network radios. So the DSA shows you how you can send and receive this information and then make use of it in the app, make the information really come alive uh, within the app. Also, real-time visibility analysis is critical in order to gain a better understanding of who you are visible to and what is visible by other objects. Uh, Runtime now supports exploratory analysis tools such as ViewShed and Line of Sight for this purpose. Because being alerted in certain situations is also critical, DSA allows you to set up rules which are continually evaluated in order to perform geofence or attribute type queries in real time. If these conditions are met, alerts are displayed in the app which can then be acted upon. Finally, Collaboration between teammates in the field is another aspect uh, which we demonstrate in the app. So you can create some simple markups and some observation reports to share with your teammates and have them shared with you. Um, we did write the app in 3D. We wanted to take advantage of some of the uh, new features that are in runtime in 3D. So we did focus on that environment for the app itself. Um, later on, we'll be showing you how to access the app and how to find out more about it, but you'll see here um, we're providing the URL for where you can find more information about the app itself um, and this help documentation that you see here in the screenshot. So what do we actually provide with this example app? It's actually a couple of different apps. That, that we allow you to build. Um, and this is because we find that typically in this environment, you need to either build for mounted or dismounted environments. So we provide a DSA vehicle um, version of the app for the mounted environment. So this is for embedded desktops or tablets that would typically be in a vehicle. So these are usually in a landscape orientation, a tablet sort of um, size device. Then also we have the DSA handheld version of the app, um, which is for the dismounted case. So this is more for mobile devices, typically using a portrait orientation. Then we also have a helper app that we're providing the source code to as well, which is just a simulator that provides um, a way of um, simulating position reports and other reports and activity that might be happening. So you can see them pop up in the, in the app as you're, as you're playing with it. So it's not mandatory to use the simulator in order to use the DSA app itself, but it's just a handy thing to have. And, and uh, we thought we'd go ahead and provide the source code um, to you for that as well. So we, we, we make this source code available on GitHub, um, and then you can build the app for these kind of, uh, the, the vehicle and the handheld version, um, and then the simulator app as well. So the app was released in April. Um, it's built on the runtime SDK 100.2.1 for Qt. So this was released back in February, uh, the runtime SDK. Now we chose Qt because it's a developer framework that allows you to build apps for several different platforms, including Windows, Linux, and Mac OS on the desktop, and then iOS and Android uh, for the mobile um, devices. The app is written in C++ with its presentation and UI elements written using QML, which is similar to JavaScript. Um, so we, um, we understand that some of you use other developer languages to build your apps. So therefore, we've tried to be as agnostic as possible in our documentation and how we've commented the code to primarily talk about how you can use runtime to meet some of these needs. Um, of course, because the app is written in Qt, there's Qt specific um, um, information in there, but uh, we wanna make sure that it's accessible to all developers. So this app it takes advantage of some of the key new capabilities that have been released with the runtime SDK over the last few releases, such as the new exploratory analysis tools, some of our symbology capabilities, um, new local data format support, such as GeoPackage and Shapefile, um, and also our dynamic graphics layer. So we've, we've um, 
built in certain tools into the app that take advantage of these, which you can see here in blue. So those tools and these, these apps and all the source code that goes with it is what's made available to you. Now, uh, I'm going to show some demonstrations of the app itself. We're not going to go into a lot of detail during this webcast on the actual code for the app, but we do have several other webcasts that are scheduled in the next uh, few months where we will go into some of that detail for some of these key areas of the app itself. So we're just going to go through some of the, these key capabilities that I mentioned um, and um, show you a demonstration and highlight some of the key uh, aspects of the code that support that in runtime. Okay, so let's start off with local data. I'll just bring up the app here. So this is the app. Um, I have it running on my Windows desktop machine. Um, we've simplified the app so that we can really highlight on the left-hand side the different categories of tools or capabilities um, that I'm going to be demonstrating to you today. So you can navigate through those different tools by using these category tools on the left-hand side. And then for each one of those, um, there's several um, um, additional tools um, and, and, and windows and panels that open up according to those capabilities. Um, so I've got my topographic base map here, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about how you can bring in local data um, and offline data. Now, there is a preferred workflow in ArcGIS for working with offline maps. ArcGIS gives you the ability to author a map and then um, define it in such a way so that it can easily be taken offline. And when you author this map, you include things like bookmarks, um, pop-ups, how you want to present it, the symbology, all those sorts of things, and that's included in the map itself. And then you can allow an app, such as um, one of Esri's apps or an app built with runtime, to connect to that map and, and, um, and ask it for a certain extent and it'll package it up and, and take it offline for you. Or you can pre-package um, the, 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 the map itself and then um, sideload it onto the device as well. There's lots of different ways that that, that that works within ArcGIS. And we have several other examples that demonstrate how to do that. In this app ex itself though, we really wanted to show um, how it would work for a really disadvantaged use case. So where you really have no um, access to a GIS server to provide those maps to take offline, or you're getting your data from another system that you don't have any control over. So you don't really know um, what the data formats are gonna be that you're gonna, gonna have to bring into the map. So for this, um, we can show how you can bring in all the different um, sorts of data formats that are supported in runtime. So we have an add data, button here at the top. And what it does is it brings up all of the um, data sets that are um, in a, a certain folder uh, on your device. So I have um, several different data sets here. I have two quick bird images. I can bring in one of those. I have a shape file of some areas of interest. Um, I have another shape file of some observers. I can bring in a mobile geo database. Um, I also have a geo package here of utility data. So I can just add those to the map and you see they're just um, brought in uh, immediately. Another interesting thing, um, because this app is in 3D, and I'll just zoom in a little bit more here, and go into um, perspective mode. We also give you the ability to um, add in um, any raster file that has elevation information in it as an elevation source itself. So if you have a DTED image that you wanna bring in as an elevation source, you can just check the box uh, here at the bottom, add selected, and uh, hopefully this is coming through in the webinar, but that just brought in a little bit more um, level of detail for the elevation data that we have. So you can receive that information on the fly um, while you're out in the field or while you're back at, at headquarters and getting new information about the mission that you're about to go on. Now we're able to access all of those layers that we brought into the map here with this um, observers, uh, or sorry, overlay uh, panel here. So there's uh, all the different layers are here, the different, um, the different uh, layers that were included in that geo package, um, the observer shape file and that image. And then you can do simple things like move them up and down, um, turn them on and off, remove them from the map, all those sorts of things. Okay, so on to the next summary of the local data. So um, again, 
Runtime supports several different uh, local data formats. Um, we support GeoPackage and Shapefile and the mobile geodatabase. And then on the raster side of things, we support RPF data, so CIB and CADRG, um, NITIF, DTED, GeoTIFF, IMG, um, and several other raster formats. Now for RPF data, we do recommend that you use the mo uh, mobile mosaic data set in order to work with this information because it's several small tiles um, that, that you would like to behave as one seamless, seamless uh, data set, and that's what the mobile mosaic data set allows you to do. And then again, rasters can, um, that have some elevation information can be used as a, as a source to that elevation surface as well. So the capabilities that the app is showing are that you can um, uh, save the visibility state and the layers that you've added to the app. So we have a configuration file that's used as part of this app. Um, it'll serialize that information about the layers that you've brought in so that when the next time you open up the app, it remembers um, and displays those layers as long as they're still available on your device. We also include that layer list control, that overlay um, list, so you can see the name of the layer, you can toggle the visibility, reorder and remove layers, those sorts of things. So a simple example of how to work with layers of information. In terms of what uh, API we use from the runtime. And the feature layer is the base class that's used in order to bring in feature data sets such as geo package, shape files, and geo databases. So you just provide it with a URL to, the, to that um, file um, on your device, um, and then it'll, it'll access that data set and bring it in. Similar for raster, we have the raster layer um, class, which lets you bring in the local um, raster data sets. And then we also use in this Qt application a layerless model, which is our MVC pattern for managing the layers that you've brought into the app and how you can present them in the map and in that layer list as well. So that's local data. Let's move on to some of the real-time feeds. So go back to my app here. Just orient myself a little bit. So as I mentioned earlier, it's critical that you can see where your current location is uh, in the map and that you can share that with others so that they can see where you are. So um, we have a little control here that lets you see where your location is. Right now, I'm not actually in Monterey, so this is uh, simulating my location um, using a GPX file, but the app will work with um, the GPS from your device as well. And so I can um, follow my location um, and have the map auto pan um, as that's happening. But this, I can choose to broadcast my location um, to other teammates that are on um, the network that, that I'm sharing with them. And this is just a small um, XML um, piece of information with my, my call sign, my location, that kind of information. And it's um, sent, uh, it's been broadcast over to my other teammates. Now we're using, um, for the purposes of this application, we're using, um, we're, we're just sending and receiving over a, a UDP port. So we haven't built in all the backend kind of communications infrastructure to support this kind of environment because we figured that's what you, the developers and the system integrators would be providing. But what this app does do is it shows you how to send that information, take information from the map and send it, and then also kind of listen um, for new messages that are being sent, parse that information, um, and then display it and make it come alive in the app itself. So that's uh, for sending my own location. Um, but I can also um, look at the latest positions of my teammates as well. So just zoom out a little bit here. Um, we'll see up at the top, I have a feeds button. This brings up another kind of list of all the different feeds. Now these are being simulated from that simulator app that I mentioned earlier. So we have a simulation of land and air tracks that are um, moving along here um, and some other situation awareness events that are occurring and some other types of reports. So once that's in the map, then I, I can, um, if I long press on it, it brings up um, some tools that are available so I can perform and identify and, and query some of the information um, um, that's being presented to me. So we are using, um, we, are, we do support military symbology standards. In this case, these symbols are using um, MIL standard 2525C. Okay. So, so again, this is um, what, what, we're, what we're demonstrating in the app itself is how you can receive and broadcast these message, message feeds over a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, the, we, we just have chosen a few simple examples of those types of feeds, like position reports, observation reports, um, situational aware, awareness events, and we're just simulating this um, and, and sending this over a UDP port ourselves. But um, 
we've just tried to keep it uh, simple in terms of what the app capabilities are. So we do um, show ways uh, to make sure you symbolize that information in the in the right way in the app. So for military symbology, um, um, we show how you use the runtime API to do that or also use other types of symbols. Um, we show how you, you can um, bring those in as graphics in the map itself. Um, we use the dynamic graphics um, overlay within the, the runtime SDK, which was built to optimize performance based on the capabilities of the device itself. So we, we know that this is real-time information. You need it to perform very well in the app. Um, so uh, we show you how to do that. And then we also show that once these, these um, different messages, these different pieces of information are in, um, these are graphics that actually, they're not dumb graphics. They actually can participate in other forms of analysis um, and, and other um, um, things that you need to do within the app itself. So um, that's another thing that we wanted to bring through in the app. So in terms of the runtime API used, we use the graphics overlay in dynamic rendering mode. There's also a static rendering mode for graphics overlays. And then in order to use military symbology, you use the dictionary renderer. So that allows you to pass it in a symbol ID code, like we're, what we're doing in this case, and it gives you back the right symbol to use. But you can also pass it in other information that kind of describes the symbol and it gets you back that, that, that symbol as well. Okay. So moving on to exploratory analysis. So Runtime now supports the ability to perform visual analysis in real time through two new exploratory analysis tools, um, which are ViewShed and Line of Sight. We have several uh, different ways to use these tools in DSA. So if I move down here to my analysis um, capability tool area, I'll show Line of Sight first. Let me actually go back and change to my imagery base map so that this comes through just a little bit better on the screen. Okay, so for line of sight, um, we show how you can bring in uh, a shape file of point data. So I brought in that shape file of observers, which are located um, uh, throughout Monterey. And instantly you can see that it's drawing those lines of sight. Now these are direct point to point lines of sight from the observers to my current location. Um, so you can see ones that are in green mean that I am visible to those observers. Ones that in red mean that I'm not. So, um, um, this is updated dynamically because you can, um, we, we've built um, our, our exploratory analysis tools so that you can connect them to features that are moving. So as um, an attribute or as a, um, the position changes for that graphic as it moves around on the map, that line of sight or that view shed updates automatically. So that's what we're showing here with our, our line of sight tool. You can also perform a view shed. So uh, one of the ways that you could do that is that you could just long press on the map itself and select view shed and it creates a view shed right then and there with some default parameters but you can also use the view shed tool that's that's here at the top and there's a couple of different things that you can do here so there's this follow touch tool in this case i'm using my mouse but um, if you click on the map it creates a view shed there and as you move your mouse or your finger around the display you can see um, that view shed update in real time. I can change some parameters. In this case, it's a, it's a full 360 view shed, so I'll just um, change the distance in it to be a little bit bigger. Once I'm happy with that, I can click Save, and then that saves it. So what we have here um, that we provide as well is this analysis list. When you create these um, analysis uh, overlays, um, it does treat them as, as overlays. So you can turn them on and off, um, you can remove them, you can manage it in that way. So we have kind of a, a, a list view here for you to manage the analysis results that you create. And I'll just show another way that you can create um, a view shed. As I said before, you can create these so that they attach to um, graphics or objects as they move around the map. So in this case, I've attached it to my current location and you can see that it's being updated um, uh, in real time. Maybe I don't want it to be a 360 view shed though. Maybe I just want it to be um, 120 degrees um, or maybe a little bit smaller. I can change some several different parameters um, when it comes to um, that view shed and, and still have it um, work automatically. So one of the things that you might notice as I zoom in and out or maybe pan and, and move around the map itself is that um, the results might change a little bit. 
Now, this is because the, the results are being calcul calculated by the GPU on the device, and it's only using the data and the level of detail that it's loaded to the screen. So this is why we call it exploratory analysis. It's just a visual indication. ArcGIS Runtime also provides several conclusive visibility analysis tools, which can be run against the source resolution of your data. So we give you several different options depending on what your needs are. If you need just a quick indication, you want to move it around using your, your mouse or, or your finger as it, as it moves along the screen, um, then, then this tool is the right one for you. If you need to attach it to a graphic as it's moving along, um, then you would use this. If you need to do um, more scientific calculations against the source resolution, then you can use um, our other tool for that and then maybe use the results for some further analysis. So that's a look at our exploratory analysis tools. Just to summarize, so um, again, it uses the GPU of the device to calculate that visibility um, analysis on the fly. We do call this exploratory analysis because it's visual only, um, as opposed to con more conclusive um, analytical tools. And there's two types. So I mentioned this a little bit when I showed it. Um, there's a location and geo element type. Location is the type that's just used based on a coordinate that you give it to it, give to it. So it's more of an ad hoc um, calculation. And then geo element is actually tied to a graphic or a feature that's in the map itself. So in the app, we show you how to, how to create these analysis overlays. Um, we show how you can present them in a list and, 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 and manage those, those overlays. And then we show how you can attach those results to, um, to existing features or graphics. Um, so the runtime API used, it's really simple. We tried to build it so it's a simple um, um, API, but as robust as possible, right? So you create an analysis overlay, and then within that analysis overlay, you can create either a location or geo element view shed or location or geo element line of sight, and then you, um, you, you, you attach it to that analysis overlay. So you can create several different analysis overlays in your map, or you can have one that has several different analysis results in it, whatever works best for, um, for your app itself. Okay, so moving on to the next feature. Um, that we wanted to show, which is alerts and conditions. So I'll go back to my topographic base map here and just zoom out a little bit more. I'll probably turn off the line of sight and some of the other activity that's going on here just to keep the map a little bit more simple. Um, so in DSA, we wanted to show a way that you could define rules, which would be carried out against the real-time feeds, which then trigger alerts in the, in the map or in the app itself. So we call these rules conditions, um, and they're constantly evaluated against these real-time feeds. Um, if you see on the left-hand side here, this is our alerts um, capability uh, tool. There's a little um, one in red there, so that means we have one new alert that we haven't viewed yet. So if I click on that, it opens up my alert list. Now the app comes with one um, predefined condition in there, and that condition is for if you have a teammate who clicks on this distress button up here in the upper hand corner. So if you say in your distress, then you're, you're in distress and as part of your location report that you're sending, um, it has a specific attribute that's flagged in there. So if I go back to my list here, I can see that I have one. Um, I can zoom to that. Um, there it is, you can see that it's flashing. Hopefully that's coming through okay. Um, but in case I need to orient myself to uh, where the location of this um, distress signal is coming from, I can highlight it in the app as well. And I can also dismiss it. If I know that that's happened, I don't need to act on it. I can distress, dismiss it and remove it from my um, alert list. So that's one example of a type of condition that you can create, um, but you can create new ones um, ad hoc as well. So in this case, I'm gonna create a new one. Um, there's several different um, priorities you can give it. And this one I'll say is a moderate. There's two different types of queries that you can make. So you can make an attribute query, which is like the distress signal one that I just showed. It's just querying for an attribute change on that graphic or as you know on those position reports as they come in, um, or a spatial one. So this allows you to do things like proximity um, alerts or geofences as well using um, geometries. So I'll give it a name. So I want it to alert me if an event is occurring within um, areas of interest that I have. So I select a source feed. So I mentioned that 
these conditions are all run against those sort those real time feeds that are in your app itself. So I'm going to select the SA events. And then um, if I do within distance of, that's the proximity distance, but I actually want to just be notified when um, when a new event occurs within or, or, or any event is currently within um, an area of uh, my AOI shapefile. So I can pick a particular feature within that shapefile or I can just say all of them. So in this case, I'm gonna say all of them. I'm gonna select AOI um, as the target um, feature data set, but you can see that I can use several different options here to, to query that against. So any objects from my AOI. And at the top here, we provide a summary of what that condition is. Um, and then I'll just say, yes, I wanna create that. And so you can see in my conditions list that there's this new event in AOI. From here, I can edit it or I can delete it um, if I wanna change it. But if I look in my alerts list, I do have one new alert that's notified there. And before I clicked on that, you might've seen that there was another little number one that showed up over here on the left-hand side. Um, so I happen to already be zoomed into that area, but I'll just show, um, like I did with the previous one, you can zoom into where that event occurred. Um, I can highlight it. I can perform some action on it. Um, maybe I wanna do a view shed, um, or maybe I wanna follow that location. So you know, my map is going to pan and, and orient and, and follow with that as it moves along. Um, there's several different actions that you can take on that. So that's our alerts and conditions. So again, these are alerting on conditions and rules that are against the real-time feeds. Um, they're always being evaluated in the app itself. Um, you can create these queries and rules um, that are either based on attributes or based on spatial um, geometries, um, such as geofences or proximity um, distance type of queries. Um, in the app itself, we show you how you can create those conditions um, and then how you can view and manage those conditions and then how you can view and manage those alerts that are then triggered from those conditions themselves. Um, and we show some ways for, for how you can manage all of that in the app itself. In terms of the runtime API, it's pretty straightforward. We show how you can use the geometry engine in order to um, perform those spatial queries. And then we also show a way that um, we, we have the graphic signal when, when an attribute or a geometry is changed, and that makes it easier for us to evaluate against those, those conditions and, and rules in real time, um, and then trigger that alert. Okay. So, finally moving on to collaboration. I'll just zoom out here again. If trying not to do this too fast. Don't wanna make anybody dizzy out there. Um, so finally, we've added some simple tools to show how you can collaborate with your teammates by sending them simple markup and observation reports. And these are also um, small little messages that would be sent over this peer-to-peer -peer, um, network like I showed with the, um, the, the, the position reports earlier on. So I can create a new observation report. It's another thing that I can do by um, long pressing on the map and selecting observation. Or another way I can do it is by um, selecting the report tool over here. We've shown one um, example in this app for an observation report. So you know, it uses a call sign um, that's in your, your app, um, or you can type in something else. Um, then you provide typical information you would with an observation that you've made. So the size or the number um, of, of items or objects that you've seen, you can describe the activity observed. So in this case, um, I've maybe seen a, specific, a suspicious gathering of, of people in a certain area. Um, I can give it a location, so either my current location, or I can just click someplace on the map or provide a coordinate. Or I could also describe the location, um, description of who's performing the activity. I think it looks like gang members. The date time observed, so I'm just gonna use the current date time. And then again, it'll summarize the information you've typed in and then you can go ahead and say create. So that's created that now, you've seen it pop over here on the left-hand side. So if I just do an identify on this, um, we'll see um, all of the information that I entered in. And down here is another one that was sent by the simulator that I have running. So we can see um, the information that was provided uh, with that one. 
So that's creating an observation report, but maybe you also want to create um, some markup, share some information, maybe a new route or a new plan that you want to send to your teammates. So we have a simple tool here that allows you to draw. Um, I can change the color. Maybe I want to um, direct my teammates um, to take a different route um, in order to investigate this new observation. Um, you know, something around here. Once I've done that, so, so I can see that and that can be um, saved in my own display, but I can also share it with my teammates. So if I select share, I can give it a name, like new root. And when I hit OK, it, it shares it across the network. Now, I don't have two versions of this app running right now, but a similar message to this one here would appear um, in the other app. So uh, a new markup has been shared with you. Do you want to um, look at it now? And it'll allow you to do that. But what it does is it actually um, serializes that and allows you to view it just like you can with any other overlay in the app itself. So if I go back to my overlays, I see that this new route is here. Um, I can turn it on and off. I can zoom to it, um, all those sorts of things. So that's serialized um, and uh, saved in that configuration, you know, that layer list that's in the configuration file as well. So the next time I open up the app, that's there. Or I could delete it, remove it, and, and, and not worry about it anymore. So those are some simple tools that, that we wanted to be able to demonstrate um, how you could use runtime to perform some of that kind of collaborative um, kind of tasks. So we know that collaboration is key for situational awareness. Um, so that's why we provided these simple capabilities to share markups and reports. Um, we provided this simple sketch tool so that you can draw and then broadcast out those markups, but also save it as a local um, overlay on your device. And then for creating the observation report, we have that simple wizard-driven tool to enter in all the information that you need and then broadcast out to others. And it's just an example that we put together of how you, how you might want to do that. Um, of course, there might be several different ways that you might um, want to present that information um, and, and, and type that information in. In terms of the runtime API used, um, we use the feature collection layer. So this is a really nice way to define an ad hoc schema and then put data and information into it. So that's what we've done for the graphics um, in order to store um, those geometries that we sketched in. And then we also used JSON serializable. So there's a to JSON and a from JSON, which allows you to um, then serialize and persist that markup information as JSON um, so that you can send it to the other teammates and then ultimately save it as this um, overlay. But then we use that then um, to draw on the map. We use a graphics overlay to do that. So um, those are some of the things that we showed for, in order to, um, to sketch those, those markups and, and send them along. OK, so that's it for the, the demonstrations of some of the capabilities that we brought into the app. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Eric now, who will start talking a little bit more about some of the additional resources and how you can ac get access to, um, to uh, the, the DSA app itself. Over to you, Eric. Great, Carrie. Thank you very much. That was awesome. And if you're a developer, you're probably wondering, well, how do I get started to build something exactly like that? Uh, and um, to access our developer platform is very easy. So developers.arcgis.com. This is your headquarters, uh, one-stop headquarters for anything developer. It, whatever kind of developer you are, you have access to all of developer resources and capabilities. Uh, and so developers.arcgis.com gives you um, a page to explore the power of the ArcGIS platform. There are different vignettes here of um, different categories of, of capability. We also have a success stories page, which allows you to view what other developers have done to build solutions. Uh, and you also have a section called ArcGIS Dev Labs. This is, uh, these are, is, is a storehouse of almost 100 different tutorials, uh, 15 minute, 10 to 15 minute tutorials to help you build your app in, in minutes. Um, and then you have a section on the page also that allows us to interact with our community, right? So you as the community of developers interact with us through uh, developer blogs, news and announcements, um, and resources such as um, support, um, you put your ideas here, uh, ESRI training opportunities uh, and resources, but also 
um, very important uh, for us to collaborate with you is our GeoNet page. And how you get started, you can just create a free uh, developer subscription today by clicking on Get Free Account. Uh, give us your password, your name. You immediately get access to all of the APIs, tools, and SDKs um, for building apps uh, for the platform or standalone apps as you've uh, seen um, uh, Carrie demonstrate. Um, another very important section here um, uh, is the example apps section. And this allows you to look at these example apps that have been built on the ArcGIS Runtime SDK platforms, all the different, uh, the six different SDKs. And here, the dynamic situational awareness uh, app, example app for Qt is what Carrie just uh, demonstrated. Her team has built this, built a page here uh, that we um, explain all of the concepts and capabilities on how to get started. Uh, but also, you can go to the source code on GitHub and uh, get this yourself, clone it, uh, work with it, see the patterns, you get the full source code uh, and the simulators uh, and as well as um, if you'd like to get the pre-compiled version of this example application hosted uh, on ArcGIS.com, you can get there and download this uh, for Windows or Android and download the example data as well. Um, to work with this example application. So we encourage you to jump in with the source code, jump in with the pre-compiled versions and collaborate with us on uh, developers.arcgis.com. So now to wrap us up, I'm going to hand us over back to Ben, um, who will uh, lead us on the way to conclusion and Q&A. So Ben? Can you show yeah, there you go. Thank you. Last slide. So, yep. So basically what we just went through today is some tools to help you as a developer um, get started building um, these mission focused applications. So these apps are agile. I think you saw um, today some examples of a toolkit you can you can leverage uh, this op you know, open source toolkit on GitHub that leverages the runtime SDK that you can take and build your own applications from. It's high performance. It captures a lot of the key requirements. Um, and um, it's it's there to help you get up and running. The runtime SDKs are really to help you develop these native uh, mission-focused applications for any environment across multiple devices. And of course, as Eric mentioned at the beginning, I don't want you to forget about this, we also have similar tools, um, a development kit for JavaScript. If you want to build web applications, you can use our software development kit and JavaScript today as well. So with that, um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so we're going to wrap up and we're going to take some questions. So if you guys can can take a look um, in the question box and start putting them in. So fortunately, I'm actually answering one of the first questions right now from Troy. He's, the question is, what is the schedule for the upcoming webinars? Is it posted somewhere? So yep, the schedule is uh, here, but it's also on um, the website for the Defense Developer Series. If you take a look at that uh, URL at the top, you can go there and make sure you register for all the future webinars. It'll also be something that you'll get as information um, and emails coming forward since you signed up for this one. So we encourage you to join us for these future webinars to learn about working with offline data, military symbology, and building app and building analysis into your application. So basically going behind the different functionality that you saw um, today. Um, from Carrie, watch you go deep dive on those and you'll see how to do um, in, in code and in um, practice how to do some of these specific functions. So we do have a couple other questions that came in from the group. I'm going to direct these questions at, at Eric and Carrie. So the, the first question is, um, is, is there a .NET version of this, um, this toolkit available, Eric or Carrie? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take that. Um, yeah, as I, as I mentioned before, we're, um, we're, we, we know that not all of you are cute developers. Um, so we do want to make sure that, you know, any developer can have access to and understand some of the best practices that we're trying to show with this DSA app. Um, we do want to make this available um, in some form. So um, please get back to us with, with, uh, with more information that you have on what you'd like to see. Obviously, it's uh, an effort to 
build this app in, in all the different SDKs that we support. So we want to focus that. Um, what we'd like to do is take some of these tools that you saw in the app and build those as part of toolkit components that are provided with some of the other SDKs. So if there's anything in particular that you're interested in that you would really like to have a tool um, built into the SDK um, um, to support your workflows, um, please get back to us and let us know and we'll happily um, take that into consideration. All right, thanks, Carrie. All right, um, another question um, is around full motion video. Can it be supported using the the SDKs and the developer tools? Yeah, um, currently runtime does not support full motion video. Um, I know we're considering it for a future future release, so there there isn't. It's not part of the API to bring that in, um, although. Um, um, that might be something that you can build in into the app yourself uh, if you need to, but it's not currently supported in, in the runtime SDKs. Right. So, and I'll just add to that answer a little bit. So, um, I will mention that we do support full motion video in, in ArcMap through an add-in, and we also are going to be supporting it in the upcoming release of ArcGIS Pro. And ArcGIS Pro can be customized with an SDK. So, if you have a desire to build a intelligence workstation or an environment for people to bring in full motion video and do intelligence analysis on it. Um, ArcGIS Pro might be a good option. And we actually have a webinar series called Intelligence Workstation that um, will take you through what we've done to customize ArcGIS Pro for this intelligence environment. And it'll include full motion video um, and the upcoming release of ArcGIS Pro this summer. Okay, all right. Um, with that, I think we're all done with the questions. So really appreciate you all joining us um, this morning or this afternoon, um, depending on what time zone you're in. And if we look forward to seeing you in our upcoming webinars. Thank you very much.